And a lot of people who don't use that system find they, themselves running out of time. They're like, I run out of time. It's like, well, are you, are you using like one subunit per day? Like, yeah, it's like, that's why. Some of them you don't need all that time. Um, so they're, they're clumped together, which is pretty great. All right, so unit two, uh, chemical bonding, yay, all right. So um, again, a lot of this is gonna be just like, like I mentioned, just like unit one and unit three and four, a lot of it's gonna be a review, but we're gonna go into greater depth and we're gonna start talking about specifics. Again, we're not gonna anthropomorphize atoms. I want to do this, I want to do that. And um, we're gonna talk about uh, electromagnetic attraction. We're gonna talk about low energy states and so on. Okay, so uh, first of all, we learned about ionic covalent metallic bonds. Ionic bonds are electrons that have been taken from another atom, given and taken, that creates ions, and they stick together. So when a non-metal takes an electron from a metal, when a non-metal with a very high electronegativity takes an atom or takes an electron from an atom with a very low electronegativity, like what chlorine does to sodium, uh, then they form ions, and those ions stick together electrostatically. Remember Coulomb's law? Coulomb's law tells us the force of attraction is equivalent to the charge of one, the charge of two, over the square of the distance between them. I'm using the equivalence to, because I'm tired of using K. K is constant for physics. You know, there is the equivalence. Okay, so when two nonmetals bond, they're going to bond covalently. Covalently means the electrons shared. Um, oxygen needs two electrons to complete its outer shell and have a filled octet. So each oxygen shares two electrons. If you were to draw the Lewis structure for oxygen, remember we start in the 12 o'clock position. One, two, three, four, five, six, because oxygen has six valence electrons. Another atom of oxygen has one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have two bonding sites and two available unshared electrons. So what happens is this unshared electron fills this bonding site and this unshared electron fills this bonding site. And what we end up having is oxygen with two each unshared pairs and then two bonding pairs. So uh, two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight. Oxygen has two bonding pairs between them, and then two unshared, two unshared, two unshared. Also called lone pairs. Unshared pairs are also called lone pairs. Uh, there is no convention saying one is right or wrong. And then these two bonding pairs will create your double bond. Okay. And we're going to develop bonding more in the future. The important thing to get at this point is that non-metals will only covalently bond with each other. Okay. Now they do have electronegativity that they can somehow sometimes force other things to bond or act like a positive ion, but that is beyond uh, what we're going to talk about right now. Okay, so once again, electronegativity, you have high electronegativity up at fluorine, next oxygen, then nitrogen and chlorine are about the same, and then it falls off from there. Okay, so and again, we don't do nuance, so if somebody said, which has more electronegativity, nitrogen or chlorine? You're like, yeah, they're pretty close. They're both just under three. Fluorine is 4.0, oxygen is 3.5, it drops off from there. Uh, so that's the big one. The important thing to remember is oxygen is bigger than most, except for fluorine. Fluorine is the biggest of all for electronegativity. Okay. Um, again, if you have, just like we talked about last year, if you have two atoms that have identical electronegativity, then they will share their shared pairs identically, equally. Okay. So oxygen at 3.5. So oxygen has an electronegativity of 3.5. Uh, because I think that's right. I think it's 3.5. Anyway, it might be 3.0. I'm just I'm having a having a wave of doubt right now, but it's big. Anyway, uh, let's say oxygen is 3.5, oxygen is 3.5. Then, since both atoms have an electronegativity that is the same, then those unshared pairs are shared equally. And if you were to draw the electron density around the atom, then you'd have to draw it equally. Make sense? Now, uh, 
if you have a case where that is very much not the case, like with hydrogen, hydrogen has a single electron, chlorine has seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, then when they bond, there is going to be a shared pair between the two of them, but because chlorine's around like one and a half, and sorry, uh, when hydrogen's around one and a half, chlorine's around three, then when you draw the electron density around this atom, it's gonna be considerably more around the chlorine than the hydrogen. This is gonna create a polar bond. You're going to have a partial positive on one side and a partial negative on the other side, where you have uh, a large bun like bunch of electrons, you're going to get a partial negative. And again, it is a partial negative. It's not a it's not a discrete positive one, positive two, positive three. It is a partial charge. And if there's a partial negative on one side, then there's going to be a partial positive on the other side. Partial positive. And these partial negatives make the molecule polar. Down here, the lack of any partial charges makes the molecule nonpolar. Now, polar and nonpolar only occur with uh, with covalently bonded things. It can be argued that there is a spectrum at Non-polar covalent on one end, polar covalent, and then ionic at the other end of the spectrum. Um, but again, the AP doesn't do nuance, so we categorize them as non-polar, polar, ionic. We throw the spectrum out. So the electron density is ba uh, like based off of the electron negativity? Yes, okay. the imbalance of electron negativity. So if you have a balanced electron negativity, the electron density is shared equally. You have a big imbalance, the electron density will punch up on one side or the other side. And then like on the test, we mm -hmm. see there's no nuance. So like if it asks us like will it ever ask us to like draw do then like a that electron density? Yeah. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say fifty percent maybe. Okay. So um, but they do like love relative. diagrams. I'm sorry. But it's like relative. Right? Yes. Like you just have to be bigger or smaller. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, they're not. No one's going to whip out a ruler and say this one is needs to be three times bigger than this one. Okay. They're not going to do that. It's going to be bigger. If if one side is obviously bigger, they're going to be cool. And okay. they love diagrams. That's um, where that's where the whole college board is moving. Diagram everything. Yeah. So could there be a question where they show you like uh, the partial negative, like, partial positive, and then you have to guess what like molecule it would be, like how different it is. From a probably from a choice. Yeah. Yeah. So it'll be they might throw something up there and like of of lithium or like it's like of boron or fluorine, which atom is most likely X. Yeah. And the one that has electrons around it would be fluorine. Okay. So that is totally fair game. Yeah, okay. that, that would be a good strategy to, to go about doing that. So but again, it's not gonna be like chlorine or fluorine. Eh, no, they're gonna be they're gonna be yeah. far away. All right. Um, and again, here is this. Here is that thing. Mathematically, if it's zero, it's nonpolar covalent. Mathematically, if it's less than half, it's less than 0.5, it's nonpolar covalent. And if it's or less than one, it's polar covalent. And if it's like more than one and a half, it's considered to be ionic. But again, that spectrum, we just kind of throw it out. We just say, let's focus on same nonpolar covalent, both nonmetals, but different polar covalent, nonmetal, metal, ionic. Throughout the spectrum, I realize you're going to still you're going to still see questions, but again, College Board just doesn't do nuance. They just it's not their thing. Yeah, are you recording? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Um, I am. Yeah. All right. So yeah, you can always refer back to it later. So any metal with any non-metal is ionic. Yes. Okay. Yep. Again, it's you could be like, well, what if it's a metal? It's like they're not going to do nuance. It's just it falls in, it let's it makes us fall into a trap where they're not testing. The concept they're testing whether uh, your teacher covered the nuance and we're not going to do nuance. Okay, so why are ionic solids brittle and not and covalent solids not brittle? Well, if you if I had let me get some quartz. If I had some some quartz or some like a big salt crystal, oh, I 
got it. <laughs> this is going to be great. Um, I know exactly what to do here. So I have a little copper salting. I can connect both. So, uh, copper sulfate, CuSO4, is crystalline. Uh, crystalline. You can kind of see they're crystals. And uh, they're not hard to smash. You can just crush them into powder. Okay. Um, because ionic compounds, you know, I'd love to have salt crystals. That'd be really great. But you, they can be crushed pretty easily. Um, because what happens when you apply a force on an ionic compound, Don't do what I just did. Don't don't put something. Don't don't take a chemical out of a stock bottle, play around with it, and then put it back. So don't do what I just did. Just shake it around a little. No, yeah. No. And you, you take out what you need, and then you throw away what you don't. You never put it in the back of a stock bottle. That's like one of the most. That's one of the the most important concepts you're you, you should learn in a college level course. Is you never put something back into a stock bottle because you don't know how you contaminated it. You can just delete that footage. Nope. <laughs> our errors are still learning, or even even our even our screw ups are still learning opportunities. But uh, so the important thing, yeah, is you have uh, if you have ionic compounds, they can be crushed pretty easily because what you're doing is you are taking your crystal where you have a positive attracted to a negative, negative attracted to a positive, and you're shifting the whole thing down. Where now, okay, I have this. That was kind of messy. Um, where now you have. Negatives next to negatives and positives next to positives. They don't like that. They like positives like to be attracted to negatives, and negatives like to be attracted to positives. So by shifting your crystal down, you create the shear line where now there that that electrostatic attraction becomes an electrostatic repulsion, and they push away from each other. Does that make sense? So this doesn't happen with covalent. It doesn't because there's no charges to attract or repel. Okay. So if you have ionic compounds, they're the whole ion, the ions are held together only by electrostatic forces, where the positives are attracted to negatives, negatives are attracted to positives, and we're all cool and happy and copacetic until you hit it with with a hammer or crush it with with pliers. You apply a force and you shear them down, where now you have an attraction or you have a repulsion of positive, positive, and negative, negative, and it's like nope, and it starts moving away, and that's why. Ionic compounds are brittle. Is that really tough? Absolutely. Yeah. That's a pretty important concept for unit two. I've got to make more of these. I made a, I made a set for myself, and I'm like people are like, those are great. So I need to make like a couple hundred more and sell on Etsy. <laughs> or some were just giving away. Or you just give them away. Using the, using the school's electricity to print them up. Okay. I made something awesome last night. Oh, yeah. What was on the birdie print? Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Is that metal? Uh, no, it's, it is, it's just gold. So it's just blue, navy blue, and gold. Um, so I'm going to, this is for Simon's. Teacher Simon just got Mr. Costa. And then Lucas has uh, Mueller. And I'm going to do Mueller's Mustangs. Because it works so well. I love alliteration. That's when you have two letters close to the other. Mm -hmm. no. It's like <laughs> Costa's Cobra, Mueller's Mustangs. And, so. and I also want to see if my printer was still up for it. I haven't I haven't used those printers in almost a year since I have since I got the school printers. And man, the school printers are so beautiful. You know the expression. Ever heard the expression "road hard and put away wet"? It has to do with horses. Like you ride them hard and put away wet. Don't even take care of them. Just put them away. Wow. That's kind of what we do with three D printers. We just beat them up and then stop. Put them in the corner. <laughs> so now I need to do a lot of work to fix them. Okay. So solubility, ionic compounds dissolve because uh, their their ions are attracted to uh, parts of the water molecule. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> well, that's fun. Um, so, this is called an ion dipole attraction. 
the dipole of the water molecule is attracted to the ion in the lattice. And we talked briefly about this a, while, a little while back, that if the ion dipole attraction is stronger than the ion ion attraction, that compound will be soluble. If the ion dipole attraction is weaker than the ion ion attraction, that compound is going to be insoluble. And how you know, just by in general, if you have plus one plus one, there's, it's almost certainly going to be soluble. If you have a plus one cation or plus, and a minus one, plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one. If you have a plus one cation and a minus one anion, almost certainly that compound is going to be soluble because the ionic strength is not very strong. When you get to plus two minus two, there's a very good chance that compound is going to be insoluble because that plus two minus two is four times relatively stronger than the, the, the plus one minus one. So there's a very good chance that the solution will not be able to be dissolved. In other words, there is a solution there. The water molecules ion dipole attraction will be weaker than the ionic lattices ion ion attraction. Okay. And that's the lingo you should use. If something is soluble, the water molecules ion dipole attraction will be stronger than the lattice's ion-ion attraction. For something that is insoluble, the lattice's ion-ion attraction is stronger than water's ion-dipole attraction. We have a whole unit in unit three on intermolecular forces, but it never hurts to preview and look at the unit, look at AP Chem holistically. Okay, polyatomic ion, okay. Let that sink in. Some of you are still scribbling before you want. No huge hurry. And so something like a plus one minus two would go into the no nuance category? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yep. Okay. So, uh, so polyatomic ions, nitrate, sulfate, uh, carbonate, these are groups of ions that are covalently bonded, but then bond ionically with other things. So SO4 Two minus, okay. Sulfur is going to act like a plus six. Oxygen is going to act like a minus two because oxygen is more electronegative. This whole thing is covalently bonded, but then it bonds ionically to ions. So SO, NaSO4, sorry, Na2SO4, you have two sodium ions that are attracted to a single sulfate ion. That sulfate is called a polyatomic ion. The polyatomic ions are covalently bonded together, but then they function as an ionic ion. And I taught you seven of them, ammonium, sulfate, nitrate, carbonate, hydroxide, uh, acetate, and phosphate. And you pretty much that's all you need to know. You learn the ones you need to know last year and we're good to go. Okay, uh, we did talk about lattices last year, but just to review, um, this is a two-dimensional representation of a ionic lattice. Ionic compounds are in lattices. Sometimes they are one to basically one to one, where every other one is a positive negative. Sometimes they're not that. Sometimes they're three to one or two to three or one to two. Um, I've never seen a question on the AP about determining ionic configuration based on charges but it's possible they could throw that at you. Just realize that if you had a ionic compound, this is NaCl, this is Na2SO4, that this would not have a cubic configuration like this. Imagine this extrapolated out. So there'd be an Na here, a chlorine here, and an Na here, and a chlorine that'd be extracted out as a cube. If it's a one-to-one -one ratio, you have a cubic crystal. I've never seen them ask about non-cubic crystals before but they could, based on formulas, they could throw one in there and, and it wouldn't be a hard question, it would be something like, it would be almost like a true false. Would you expect it to be a cubic? It's like, not if it's not one to one, only if it's one to one would you expect it to be cubic, but I've never seen a question like that. Who knows, they might, but I doubt it. All right, we have it zooming right along. Um, again, more arrangement of ions, not super important. Okay, metallic bonding. We talk bonding is super, it is super important. Uh, so we, we talked about this last year, nothing new. The D block metals 
and then things that have D block metals, those D block orbitals are long enough that they overlap like chains. Okay, so if you had uh, a, a copper and a na nearby copper, I have a racer to one. Oh, right. Lucas grabbed the eraser, took it away. He was playing yesterday. It's like, I pick him up after school at 3 o'clock, they come back over here about 3.30. I want to go home. They want to play. Um, so imagine copper's D block orbitals. Okay, these are D orbitals. Um, it would be in the it would be in the neighborhood of nearby copper D block orbitals, and there would be this overlap. So as the electron moves, it doesn't it doesn't it, it travels from orbital to orbital to orbital, and it doesn't encounter uh, space a gap. So it, it easily goes from orbital to orbital to orbital to orbital, which is why D block metals and metals that have D block electrons conduct electricity very very well. Electrons go boop, 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 boop. If you make them really cold, they conduct electricity even better. But that's the realm of physics. Superconductivity and resistivity and all that stuff. But the important thing is we call this the electron C model. And the word we use is delocalized electrons. They're shared amongst all of the D metal nuclei. The nuclei exist in a sea of electrons. They're shared uniformly. You can't really paint one electron and figure out where it is later on. But they are delocalized. So, so that's because D, the D block is so big. The orbitals, no, because the orbitals are so long. Why? They, they, because they extend so far out away from the nucleus, they overlap with each other. So what's the other F, F block? F block did that too, um, but we never deal with that block. F block is for someone else. Yeah, Isn't F block all synthetic? Um, everything after uranium is synthetic. The two, the so everything after uranium is synthetic, um, and then the uh, so the first the uh, lanthanides are not. Lanthanides are do actually exist um, on the planet. Um, it's everything after that. What is that? Um, so the, the F block are the lanthanides and the actinides. So all the lanthanides, except for promethium, promethium is artificial. The, the two weird ones are technetium and promethium. These are our two artificials that could actually exist on the planet, but for reasons we don't understand, or I don't understand, they don't. Um, but the, they do exist. Most of them are in, are in Southeast Asia. I don't know why. Uh, and then uranium, that's the, that's the heaviest naturally occurring element. And that's, that's the there's only four elements in the actinides that are uh, that are not artificial. Everything after uranium are called transuranium, meaning we made them in a lab. And then all of then after uranium, all of the eighth uh, all of the eighth period after uh, Laurentium, all of these are artificial too. Rather fortium down to Agonesson. All right, are we good to go? Okay. Uh, we talked about solutions. Again, nothing new for solutions. We categorize, we categorize solutions as heterogeneous and homogeneous. Homogeneous means literally same stuff. Heterogeneous literally means different stuff. So if you have a solution in front of you and you can see there are definitely different things, we call them phases, but they don't have to be like layers, just phases, then it is a heterogeneous solution. If you look at a solution, it's clearly you can't identify where the things are. It's homogeneous, like Kool-Aid's a good example of a homogeneous mixture, and lemonade's a good example of a heterogeneous mixture. You can definitely see where the pulp is in in uh, lemonade. You can't see where the sugar crystals are in Kool-Aid. So it's physical. Yeah. 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 So homogeneous means you don't see the stuff. Correct. Homogeneous literally means same stuff. Heterogeneous literally means different stuff. So if you can see if you can see where one stuff starts and the other stuff ends, then it's going to be heterogeneous. If you can't see where different stuff starts and ends, then it's homogeneous. Okay. And then uh, when you have a solution, solutions are further separated into their uh, what is most and what is in the most. So the thing that is the most stuff 
is given the title solvent, and the thing that goes into the most stuff is given the title solute. I'm not wearing my ring, but those could be any phases. Like in jewelry, the solute is whatever they add to the gold to make it stronger, unless it's 10 karat gold. Fun fact, uh, jewelry is given a carat system like gems, but it's a different kind of carat system. It is a portion of 24 parts. So a 24 karat gold is 24 parts gold, no parts anything else. Uh, so that's 24 karat gold. Most jewelry is 20 or 18 karats gold. 18 karats gold is 18 parts gold and six parts something else. So gold would be the solute solvent and silver, chromium, maybe even steel, uh, uh, copper would be the solute. 10 karat gold, gold is the solute and whatever they mix it with is the solvent. So the, sol the solvent goes in. The solvent is what you, is the most, is the most okay. and the solute ah. goes into the solvent. Okay. Now, in a solution of water, the solvent is almost always water and the solute is whatever you dissolve into the water. But again, they can be any phases. Air, does anyone know what the sol solvent is in air? Nitrogen. Nitrogen, yeah. So 78% of air is nitrogen, so nitrogen is the solvent. And then the oxygen, carbon dioxide, argon, neon, everything else that goes into it are solutes. All right, how are we doing so far? Fantastic. This is what we're talking about. We're about to talk some about some pretty cool interstitial and substitutional alloys. So again, I don't have my ring, which is sucks because it's a great example. Gold alloys are great examples of alloys. Um, steel is a good example of an alloy too. An alloy is a mixture of a metal and something else. Steel is what's called an interstitial alloy. Interstitial meaning getting in the way, in between. So interstitial literally means in between. So an interstitial alloy is what you get when you take a small atom and you put it into a metal, causing that metal to change its properties. So steel, um, we use steel, not iron, because if I made pliers out of iron and I crushed something, they would bend. Iron's not all that strong. It's, it's very dense, it's very, it's very heat resistant, but it's crazy, it's not very strong. Um, so when someone realized you could take an iron sword, which would not be all that practical, uh, bronze was better, take an iron sword, add carbon to it, simply by quenching the iron sword in charcoal or oil, oil has a lot of carbon, so it's charcoal, um, steel came about, and steel is vastly stronger because what happens is there's carbon atoms stuck in between the iron atoms. So when I want it, when I want it to bend, the iron atoms want to move away, the carbon gets in the way, kind of locks them in position. So imagine throwing sand into some gears. That's what's happening. The gears would normally move fine. Once you throw some sand in there, there's so much friction that they can't move. That is an interstitial alloy. And it's ion bonds. No, they're, they're metallic. Um, the, uh, the electrons still want to get from iron atom to iron to atom to iron atom, but the carbons are simply in the way. So it's not bonded to them. Um, it kind of, it kind of is, it is. Okay. You know, you know, for the purposes of the test, no, they are still D block bonded and the interstitial things are getting in the way and not bonding for the purposes of the test, interstitial alloys, they are simply mixtures. They're not actually bonded to the metals. Yeah, this is also kind of cool. This is also why steel has a higher density than iron because there's these gaps. And what you've done is you've added small atoms into those gaps, which doesn't appreciably change the volume, but it does appreciably change the mass. So steel is more dense than iron, which is kind of cool. All right, brass. Got some brass in the other room. Brass is a substitutional alloy. We're actually going to use this brass in a really cool lab coming up. So, uh, this is shiny brass too. Um, so, there's your brass. Brass has a goldish color because what happens with a substitutional alloy is you 
put two metals that are similar size and similar properties, like copper and zinc, they're right next to each other. So they have similar sizes. So they alloy very, very well. And when you have a substitutional alloy, you just blend the properties of the two. Okay. You get, uh, you get zinc strength and copper's uh, resistance to corrosion. In fact, it, it's kind of, it's not even a, um, what's that word where the, the two, the whole is better than the, the sum of its parts. Um, it'll come to me eventually. Anyway, the whole is better than some of those parts. Brass is is stronger than copper and zinc, and it has better corrosion resistance than copper and zinc. Um, um, that's a substitutional alloy when they are similar sizes. All right, how are we doing? I think we're just about done. We're ready to do some exercises. Yep, that's it. All right, number seven. So you're doing the uh, the closed ended. Create a visual representation of a particulate model of an ionic solid in two dimensions. Any ionic solid, cations and anions are always arranged so that the Coulomb bonding forces of attraction between positive charges are maximized and repulsive forces between them are minimized. Keep the periodic trends on relative sizes in mind. So um, just on your slate, draw a quick drawing of what, uh, for number seven, of what a particular model of an ionic solid in two dimensions is. There you go. So do that on your slate and on your, your whiteboard, and then we'll see if we agree. This will be fun. I'm going to use my whiteboard. I'm going to use whiteboard too. I don't like to draw on whiteboards. Who doesn't like to draw on whiteboards? I think that Miss Wagner for these. She's like, we have these whiteboards and nobody used them. Like, awesome. All these are awesome. I actually asked for kind of my words. Look at these great ones. Love these things. So just any <laughs> My ions got progressively bigger as they went from left to right, and I erased it and did exactly the same thing again. They got a little smaller. They get smaller, they go from left to right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'm done with my drawing. Are you doing your drawings? I think so. I'll show what you got. Oh, good job, Luke. So, um, small. small and bigger? Yeah, okay. Um, so the they kind of teed it up, up for you and said, keep in mind, keep the periodic trends for relative sizes of atoms in mind. Um, cations are going to be small, anions are going to be big. So draw something along those lines. You got small cations, large anions. That's pretty much what they're, again, they're not going to whip out a ruler and say, the cation should be a third the size of the anion. They're not going to do that. They're just looking for are your cations smaller than your anions? Should I make sure I label the charges? Or yes, yeah. or create a key of some kind. That's a very good point. Um, so Luke asked, should you rate, label the charges? I know the small circle, big circle. Um, create a key or label them in some way. Um, when the college board gives you a diagram, they will actually give you a key. Like squares represent this atom and triangles represent this ion and circles represent, they will do that. Um, so it doesn't hurt to do the same thing back to them, make a little key. So it works. Uh, so it's very clear what we're talking about. All right, are we cool with number seven? All right. Numero ocho. No, numero no, numero nueve. Numero ocho has been covered up. The following questions contain a pure sample of iron and a sample of steel. Create an illustration of pure iron, which shows the iron atoms and provides visual representation of the electron C model. Do the same with steel. So draw a little particle model of iron and a particle model of steel. So the 
iron, we do like a long electron. Wouldn't hurt, but it might make your drawing kind of messy. Okay. I don't really know if I like my drawing or not, but I think you guys need a little more time, so take a little more time. Get the cover salt here, right? Proper reports this week. I usually wait till Friday to do them, but I just realize they are due. I will be yelled at if I don't have them on in on Friday at two o'clock. Mm -hmm. Barb likes to have a big fat buffer between when she has to submit hers and when ours are due. All right, so this is what I did. I just did my iron nuclei with a bunch of electrons floating around. Again, yours might not necessarily right or wrong, but yeah, just yeah, put the put the nuclei in there and throw the electrons all over them, kind of like a uh, classic example of the electron C model is. That. So you got your nuclei with electrons cruising all around. And then for the interstitial steel alloy, um, just throw some carbons in between some some irons and call it a day. All right. In what ways have some of the bonds changed when this alloy was formed? Um, so what happened to the bonds between the iron? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not sure if that's a super important thing. But you could basically say, um, you, the bonds didn't really change much, but atoms were put in between the nuclei. So, the, I mean, steel still conducts electricity very well. Steel can still conducts heat very well. Um, the bonds might have gotten longer by putting the carbon atoms in between, but there's, they still exist in the electron C model. So the bonds didn't really change much. They just got a little bit longer. What type of alloy is steel? What is the word we use for that alloy? Interstitial. Yeah, interstitial. Identify four properties that change when carbon is added to pure iron in order to make steel. Um, so when you're talking about metals, you have a number of properties. We talked about these last year, nothing new. Malleability is how it moves, basically how it bends. So steel is less malleable than iron. Um, ductility is like malleability, the ability to be stretched into a wire, though. So ductility would... You, you'd reduce ductility. Um, 
And then melting point, steel would have a higher melting point because the molecules are not able to move as much. Remember, in order to melt something, the molecules have to move enough that they break up out away from their locations. So the melting point would go up. Steel has a higher melting point. Um, electrical conductivity would be a little bit less, but not a lot, but it'd be a little bit less. And then, uh, yeah, basically things that make steel harder and would slow the electrons down. So it would be, it would be less ductile, it would be less malleable, it would conduct electricity not as well, still pretty good. And it would also conduct heat less well, still pretty good though. Which is why, you know, you go to go to someplace like, I only use cast iron in my pots or your, my pans. Like, All right, it's crazy heavy and that needs to be thick because it doesn't fall apart. The handles will fall off. But um, cast iron skillets do transfer heat really well. When they bring out that pot or they bring out that, that pan of fajitas, the reason they use cast iron in a little fajita pan is because it keeps the heat for a long time. <coughs> because that's iron. Iron holds onto its heat very well. Explain how carbon changes the properties outlined in part E. Something along the lines that it gets in the way. It causes the, it causes the electrons to bump into stuff. And it also causes the lattice to be uh, less fixed. The lattice is less, less fixed in position, or more, sorry, more fixed in position. So, because the iron's like, nope, I can't get there. There is a carbon in the way. Macroscopic properties of a pure sample of an unknown solid were examined in order to determine the property type of bonding between the particles. The solid is very hard. When it is broken, the fragments form similar three-dimensional shapes. When dissolved in water, the resulting solution conducts electricity. Make a prediction about the type of bonding in this compound and justify your answer. So go ahead and make a prediction. Alexa, stop. Make a prediction on your uh, on your notes or on your your whiteboard, what do you think the compound is? Is it, uh, make a prediction about its bonding type, and then make a justification, what defend is, your answer. What is the three, what is similar three-dimensional shapes imply? Oh. Right so far. Cube, still a cube. Yeah, ionic compounds will always follow their at the macro level, they will always follow the arrangement of atom or of ions at the micro level or atomic level. I got molybdenum. Yay. I got germanium. Yay. Mr. Deco is creating little stickers that say, do not shake, do not open. I even got silver. Yay! Or silver. All right, so what is it? Um, yeah, it's an ionic compound. Um, and again, the, the explanation, you got, it's very hard, that's good. When it is broken, the fragments form similar three-dimensional shapes, so the solid will still be in the lattice, okay? Every salt crystal, whether it be microscopic or macroscopic, is uh, basically a cube or cubes stuck together. It's pretty slick. And that extends out even to massive structures. Um, when you get a, some time, um, search for the Giant's Causeway. I'm not gonna show you a picture now because it took me too long and we only have two minutes left in class. Um, the Giant's Causeway are massive structures of quartz and basalt and they're hexagons. It looks like uh, a D&D player put a bunch of hexagons down in the beach. But they're they're just massive and they're they're hexagons because that's what the structure is at the atomic level. Um, dissolving here's the big one: when dissolved in water, the resulting solution conducts electricity. It has to have ions to conduct electricity. And lastly, microscopic properties of a pure sample of no solid were examined. When hit with a hammer, it dents, does not shatter. 
When clean with steel wool, it becomes very shiny. The solid conducts electricity, but does not dissolve in water. What is it? Metal. Deep black metal. Yeah, it's a metal. Deep black metal. Because it's dense, it's malleable. All right. Another time. I mean, lunchtime. <laughs>